Still going with the red shirt, ladies and gentlemen. Still going. Theme two from Unit 8, Seeking to Fulfill Reconstruction-Era Promises. Civil rights activists and political leaders achieved some legal, success, legal and political successes in ending segregation, although progress was slow and halting. So seeking to fulfill Reconstruction era promises, in other words, seeking to live up to the mantle of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, calling for equality, voting rights, opportunity for African Americans, civil rights activists and political leaders achieve some legal and political success. That's different from social success, right, in the sense that I might get a law passed, but getting people to live by that law, it's another thing, although progress was slow and halting. Let's talk about it. So starting under President Eisenhower, in fact, let's start even earlier. Under President Truman, Truman desegregated the armed forces uh, in 1948. So during the Korean War, American forces fought in desegregated units for the first time since the Revolutionary War, uh, another great American struggle. So uh, that was Truman's contribution there on a civil rights level. Under Eisenhower, you have a flurry of reforms. Now, let's be honest about something. Eisenhower, not a civil rights guy. Eisenhower is not really that interested in civil rights becoming a huge issue. But he will get involved here a lot of the times in order to assert the power of the federal government. We'll talk about that in a moment. The landmark one is Brown versus Board of Education. Now, under Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled that segregated schools were unconstitutional, that segregation had no place in public schools. Of course, the Chief Justice in that case, BHS alum, Earl Warren. Woohoo! Uh, what we should remember here is that the case number one only Angel applies. Angel Alanis, your ride is waiting in the office. It only Angel applies Alanis, to schools. Waiting. Okay, so it does not apply really to all other sectors of life, even though we're going to use it as a, a kind of blueprint for how to crack down segregation in other areas. And secondly, it said that schools had to do the desegregation with all deliberate speed. That language there becomes really debatable with all deliberate speed. Do they mean quickly? Can southern schools drag their feet? So the ruling itself does not, by its nature, assure a great deal of change outside of the area of public schooling. The Little Rock Nine, Little Rock, Arkansas, a group of students decided to test the desegregation law by attending Central High School in Little Rock. Now, Little Rock was a southern state, a segregated state, and these students were attempting to attend the school, and of course, that was highly controversial. The governor of the state essentially told President Eisenhower that things would be fine, that things wouldn't be a problem at all. And uh, the governor essentially went and saw President Eisenhower and talked to Eisenhower and then left Eisenhower with the idea that he would go home and he would make sure that these students got into the school and there would be no problem. Now, come the first day of school, there are massive military forces. The Arkansas National Guard has been called out by the governor to make sure that there are not riots and problems. Interestingly, the students showed up with escorts of black and white preachers, uh, basically groups of religious people across the town had come together to escort them onto campus. And when things did get a little bit heated, President Eisenhower took the opportunity to send in the 101st Airborne and nationalize the Arkansas National Guard, and as a result of it, assure the integration of Central High School in Little Rock. Now, what's the point, Holiday? The point is that for the first time since Reconstruction, a president of the United States has gone into a southern state and essentially made them follow the letter of a law. Since 1877, when Reconstruction ended, there's been a huge disconnect between the federal government and these southern states. This is Eisenhower, perhaps in a very military fashion, getting back into the business of assuring that we live up to the right law. The Montgomery bus boycott uh, spreads the idea of desegregation into other areas. The cities. Uh, I beg your pardon, the city of Montgomery, Alabama had a segregated bus system, although uh, the busing was primarily used by African Americans. Uh, most of the seats on the buses were set aside for African Americans, but you had African Americans sitting at the back and you had whites sitting at the front. Now, uh, when they decide to challenge the law, Rosa Parks is a perfect candidate here. She's young, uh, she's bright, she seems to be a very popular young woman. Uh, keeps to herself, though, she's not kind of uh, overly showy, if you will, but she makes a fantastic test case in that when she's arrested, she has the poise 
and the manner that's required. The other individual who really rises as a result of the bus boycott is Martin Luther King Jr., who goes from being a local preacher to being the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is going to become a very important part of the nonviolent civil rights movement here of the 1950s and in the 60s. Together, Parks and King organize a massive boycott of the bus system, utilizing friendships and cars and pre-existing social groups within local churches to assure that the buses aren't being used. Now, what does that do? Eventually, it starves the city of bus revenue, but it also starves downtown businesses of bus riders and the shopping that goes on with them. And as a result of it, eventually the bus boycott ends when the ruling of segregated busing goes down as well. Moving it to a younger generation. Starting in 1960, we begin to see the work of the SNCs, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committees, which came out of the SCLC. The SNCs are college-age young African-American men and women who go and sit in at lunch counters. And you sit in as a way of protesting. Again, it's nonviolent. You sit. You're using economic protest. You're waiting. And you're not going to be served. You don't want any food. What you want is to starve the business of its profits, to cause enough hullabaloo that you're going to get arrested, and then a new group of people is going to come in and sit down, and then they're going to get arrested, and eventually the business is going to have to choose between its principles and keeping the doors open because it's not making any money at lunchtime. It's a brilliant nonviolent strategy, and it's an important part of the civil rights movement growth. Moving it ahead, under President Kennedy, there's significant kind of spring and summer of marches in Birmingham, Alabama, and then in uh, Washington, D.C., culminating with the I Have a Dream speech in 1963. That's probably the moment where the civil rights nonviolent wing has its high point. Uh, starting even in the mid-1960s, there are significant voices in the African-American community who believe that Martin Luther King Jr.'s route of civil rights is a good one, but it isn't the only one, that there are other ways uh, that progress can be achieved and that perhaps those ways should be pursued. Under Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, mammoth political and legal ramifications, uh, the ending of, um, I beg your pardon, let's start with the Civil Rights Act, my fault. Civil Rights Act would have ended any sort of discrimination in public places. Uh, the Voting Rights Act would have ended uh, literacy tests, and the 24th Amendment ended poll taxes. By doing all of that, African Americans should have equal access to the voting polls and also to public places, and that should bring down a lot of the barriers to participation in the democratic process. There are, though, some groups that are arguing that even at that point, more radical steps are necessary. Black Panthers, talking about the Black Power Movement, who believe that when violence is presented, that violence should be returned. Uh, are beginning to clamor and say that the, the attempts of Martin Luther King Jr. have been tried, that peaceful non-resistance has been given its chance and it hasn't resulted in a better society. It's time for something more radical. The same sort of tactics come out of the Brown Berets looking for Latino rights and Cesar Chavez, who later in the 1960s and then into the 70s puts forward hunger strikes and protest movements aimed at hide, or aiding, I beg your pardon, uh, the plight of migrant farm workers. AIM, the American Indian Movement, has a, a takeover of Alcatraz where they're attempting to bring attention to the plight of American Indians in uh, the United States. Feminists pushing for an equal rights amendment, but also pushing for things like equal pay and abortion rights and more time off after babies are born and what would be kind of the feminist issues of the day, right? The vote has been achieved. It's time for a new agenda. And that new agenda includes these more radical, by definition of the day, these more radical steps. And lastly, Rachel Carson, who is an environmentalist who writes about Silent Spring, about the pesticides that are going down into our water supplies. One more video to go.